Take your Bible, if you would, please. I appreciate you all coming here. Appreciate you being here. Appreciate uh, our visitors. We welcome you. We want you to feel at home, and we want you to know that you're just sitting in with a bunch of rotten, dirty, hell-deserving sinners that have been saved by the grace of God. Say amen to that. And there ain't a one of us here worthy of heaven, worthy of going to heaven, worthy of the grace that God's given us. All of that was done at the cross of Jesus Christ. It was done by God and for God and for His glory and for His praise and for His kingdom. He just happened to bless us on the side. Amen. Amen. Ephesians chapter 6, we kind of uh, are going through our enemies. This all started out, if you remember, several, several weeks ago when I thought that I was going to preach a, a series of messages on the life of Samson. And uh, I didn't didn't make it out of did, just didn't make it out of the out of the shoot. I made it to verse one, I think, of Judges chapter thirteen, and it said the Israelites have been under the Philistines' bondage for forty years. And I got to thinking about that number forty and what it means. By the way, uh, uh, Steve and Jenny that was here uh, last Sunday. They've been here for part of the week. They always come to our homecoming and they, they stick around for a while. They went, um, they left here and they went out to the, uh, the Noah's Ark out there in Kentucky. Who's ever been out there? But I want to tell you something. When you first pull up out there and you stand upside that thing, it'll make you stop and think about the, the miracle that it was that Noah ever got that thing built. I mean, that thing is huge. And uh, that was, uh, I think, some of you, if you've heard of Ken Ham, Kent Ham, he is a creationist uh, from Australia, New Zealand, New Zealand, one of those two, he's got, a, he's got an accent. But anyway, um, I don't know where he got all the money from, but he built that, and then there's a creation museum not too far from there. I think they're going there. But Steve sent me the picture that uh, they took when they got to the ark and I remember Lisa and I went out there and uh, I don't know how it is now but uh, a few years ago we went out there and we went up to it and I'm just sitting there looking at this thing and I'm just I'm just going wow and they play a video there as you're get as you're in line going through the little cattle deals back and forth back and forth and they kind of show you a time lapse of how they built it and I'm I'm going through my mind the number of uh, the number of architects, Steve is an architect, and the number of architects that worked on, on how that thing should be built and, you know, what needs to go into it. And then the number of, of people that worked as contractors on that. Guys wearing, uh, hard hats and the number of cranes that were brought in, the number of, number of trees that were taken down and, and shaped just right to make that arc. The number of men then who were shaping those, uh, those trees and that lumber and setting and putting all that together and the, and the, the technicians, there's a lot of technical things in there and, and the craftsmen, the people that built, uh, the different displays that are in there. And there, I mean, there probably, if, if I say there was probably 5,000 people working on this thing, that, that may be an understatement. And I don't know, it took them, I don't know how many years. And then no sooner than I thought that, God put it in my mind. And what's making me think of that is this message. I've been, I've been teaching on the, some meanings behind the number four. And the Holy Ghost, I'm sitting there looking at this thing, and the Holy Ghost asked me, said, now, Mike, how many men built the ark? Noah, Shem, Ham, Ham, and Japheth. Four men. And what did that ark represent? Salvation. And you've got in your Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, four men. And what are they writing about? Our salvation, our ark. The thing that's going to save us and bring us 
from this world to the new one. Somebody say amen. So it takes that to fight what we're fighting here in this world. Ephesians 6, you got it there on the screen. I want you to open your Bible up to it. Read along with me. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And uh, let me, let, let me uh, read something else in here. Yeah, there it is in verse 13. Look, put your eyes on verse 13 for a minute. That's not up on the screen, so you'll have to open your Bible up. I'm going to make you open your Bible up before we get out of here. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. He says it again. That you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Now, I read a verse uh, this last week, and I don't quite remember where it was. I could probably find it using the software, but it was talking about the day of evil. And I went, that's got to be the same thing. The evil day and the day of evil. Let me tell you something. There's an evil day coming. A very evil day day is coming and it's going to be a dark day the prophets in the old testament told us the day of the lord is at hand it is a day of darkness a day of clouds and thick darkness a day of gloominess and so many people are so oh can't wait for the rapture to happen oh it's going to be a glorious day well maybe just maybe God may want us to stand during the evil day before our glory gets here. Give you something to think about, something to chew on for a while. Because He definitely tells us, He's telling us, Wherefore, you take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. I look out over this congregation this morning, and I love everybody in here. And if you were my worst enemy, and you were sitting in here, I would love you enough to want to tell you there is an evil day coming. Whether you want to believe it or not, and I'm asking you the question, will you be able to withstand in that day? And if you think... You say, well, no, well, yeah, we, we're, we're going to make it because we bought one of them uh, underground uh, bunkers and we got food under there and we got water and we got us a generator and we're going to we're going to last it out. I don't think so. I don't think so. Because when God starts doing stuff here on this world, nobody escapes. Did you know that your Bible, did you know that your Bible in two places, in fact, they're almost on the same page, in Amos and Obadiah both, God said, if you dig into hell, I will bring you back up. If you escape into the heavens, if you make your nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. And what are we doing? I watched videos yesterday about... How NASA is, is planning on getting us there to the moon, put a station on the moon, and they're going to put people on Mars, and then we have, we're building things now that sounds like science fiction, that will one day, they say, we will go to other stars. I don't care how high they go, God's going to bring them back down. Because I think some people got it in their mind, if they escape here, they'll escape God's wrath. Well, you don't escape God's wrath. Because no matter how high you get, you're not near as high as the most high. Somebody say amen. Alright, now, I'll get to the message. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, let's count them, but against principalities, against powers. Like we've studied that out. against, the, And I probably left out all kinds of notes on powers. But against the rulers of the darkness of this world. And against spiritual wickedness in high places. I, I want you to ask yourself before we pray. Uh, have you ever been in a dark place? Now I'm going to ask you that in several different ways. Number one. 
if you ever been into a tavern that was well lit? Okay? Have you ever been in a, a place where somebody was dealing drugs? We had a guy this that came here years ago, him and his wife, and they struggled. Boy, they struggled. They were trying to get back together and trying to make their marriage work, and I think eventually they did. But he was going over to Brooklyn, Illinois, and East St. Louis, and he was going to those uh, topless bars over there. Uh, a white man going over there buying drugs. And I told him one day, I said, they're going to kill you dead one of these days. They're going to see you coming and think, here's somebody from over at the other side of the river. I bet he's got a pocket full of money. And they're going to rob you. They're going to rob you dead. And uh, I think eventually, uh, I think eventually he got some help for his problem. He had a bad drug problem. And I'm just saying to you, have you, have you, have you remember the day when you used to go to dark places? Have you ever been in a dark place emotionally? Those are tough. Those are very tough. Uh, when you were in sin, you were in a dark place. The God of this world blinded your eyes and your mind. And you only thought you were okay. You weren't. You were blind as a bat. You were blind to your own sin. You, you know what? You know what blind people who are sin blinded do? Justify their sin. They justify what they do is right. They read the Bible and they'll say amen to a sermon. But when it comes down to it, to what they do, what they do is right, and because they have reasons. They reason it out amongst themselves that they're right. But the, the problem is, sin blinds your eyes. And you can't see the reality of just how wrong you really are. Well, that's what we're going to deal with this morning. We're going to deal with um, the rulers of the darkness of this world. Father, help me to preach this message. Lord, I can't do it without your help. I can't preach it without the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God's Son, crying, Abba, Father, the Spirit of Jesus in this place, the preacher. I can't preach it without Him being present, not only here in the pulpit, but in every pew and in every heart. Father, I pray, dear God, that you would bless this message as it goes not only to the folks here, but through the camera's lens and out into, Lord, whoever can watch this and wherever they're watching it from, whether they're at home in California, Oklahoma, Indiana, Texas, or they're listening to it at night on the radio in faraway Kenya, I pray, dear God, wherever this message goes, Lord, you would bless it. You would use it for your kingdom and your glory's sake. To honor your name. To build your kingdom. To build your house. And Father, I pray, dear God, that you would show us, dear God, the light in the time of darkness. Bless the word of God this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said to that, Amen. Turn to Genesis chapter 1. I apologize for making that. No, I don't apologize for making that small. I hope you can't read it. Turn your Bible to Genesis chapter 1. Let me illustrate something for you that just, and I'm going to just make sense. In Genesis 1, in fact, let's, we're going to start reading in verse 1 and we'll read down to verse 5. And, and this is, I'm going to tell you something. I, I, I love you. And I care about you, and, and some of you I don't know very well, so I don't know, I don't know what schooling you're from, I don't know what you learned, I don't know what it is you believe, but I'm gonna tell you something, if you don't believe Genesis 1-1, you just might as well call out the rest of the Bible and say, I, there ain't nothing in there for me. If we weren't created by God, then where in the world, where in the universe did we come from? Where in whatever Big Bang, whatever Big Bang happened to make you show up here today? 
When you start adding, when you start adding up the number of accidents that had to happen for this planet to bear the number of life forms that it has on it, right? And we're talking about tens of thousands of different varieties of life forms on this world, all happening by accident or accident. Are you crazy? Uh, that I was talking about that ark a while ago. Bill Nye, the science guy, went through that thing. Kent Ham invited him to go through it, and all he did was fuss and fight and argue about everything that was in there. Poor man just don't have a he just don't have the right religion. He's got a religion, all right. His religion is himself. He's his own God, his intellect. But it just makes sense to just believe in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Somebody say amen. And the earth was without form and void. This is how you were before, before you got saved. You were without form and void and darkness was, was upon your life. Darkness was upon the face of the deep and the Spirit of God began to move in your life, began to move upon the face of the waters. And God, one day, one day, God in His mercy looked down upon you and said to you, let there be light. And there was light. Amen. That's how you, that's how you know Him. That's how you know Jesus. That's how you know God is in you and God loves you and God forgives you. God said, let there be light. And there was light. Now notice this, and God saw the light, that it was what? Isn't that something that in every philosophy that you can find, light equals good. Um, George Lucas, when he first made the first Star Wars film, knew this. How did he dress Darth Vader? In black. How did he dress Luke Skywalker? In white. The Lone Ranger never wore black. Amen. He always beat up somebody named Black Bart. Who first beat up Tonto. I'd hate to be Tonto. He got beat up every show. Amen. Now I've got to get off that. God saw the light that it was good. Now watch this. God divided the light from the darkness. Those two do not get along. You cannot say, I love God, I love Jesus, and walk in darkness. You can't do it. You can't do it. God called the light day. And the darkness He called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. See, God is the one who made that. And by the way, God made both of them. And that's what I was reading. I, boy, I'd like to find that verse. That's aggravating me now. The day of evil. And it had to do with the fact that God made Bad people and God made bad angels and some people can't handle that. But I'm telling you, God made them all. If you happen to know what verse I'm talking about, you just raise your hand and say, Pastor Mike, it's in uh, whatever, whatever, whatever. Look up the phrase, the day of evil, if you can do that. All right. It's going to aggravate me to death until we find it. In fact, I won't preach. How's that? Now look in verse 14. Notice this. Notice this, for those of you who try to jam uh, evolution into your Bible, it don't work. You say, well, you know, the first day was the Big Bang, and that's when all the, that's when all the, uh, everything was made, and, and the stars, and then they formed galaxies and all that junk. Uh, excuse me, but God created dry land, water, and God put uh, grass and trees and vines and shrubs and plants all over the earth before he ever made a sun, a moon, and the stars. So what was the source of light for when God made all the plants of the earth on day three? God. Amen. Then God said, did you find the verse, John? Yeah. Yeah. Do you hear that? God hath made all things for himself, yea, the wicked for the day of evil. You say, well, why did God make wicked things? It all has to do with something that humans have that dolphins don't, goldfish don't, your cat doesn't, and your dog doesn't have. Free will. 
choice. We've got a choice. And you can't have a choice between good and evil if God only lets you access what's good or if God only makes what's good. If God did not create anything bad or evil, then we wouldn't have a choice, would we? And now ask yourself the question, would you rather the, the ways like a lot of civilizations do it, where they have arranged marriages, where you have to marry somebody whether you like them or not, would you rather do that? Or would you rather be in a situation where you married somebody because you loved them and they loved you back? You had a choice, you had a say in it, amen? Well, that's what God is doing. He's got a son, Jesus Christ, and God said it's not good that the man should be alone. I will make and help meet for him. We, the church, the bride of Christ, are the help of Jesus Christ. We're the bride of Christ. And we're only the bride of Christ because we want to be the bride of Christ. Ain't nobody going to be in heaven that's going to go, I hate this place. This place stinks. Amen. Now, I'm getting a little wound up. Look at verse 14. And God said, let there be light in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs. In fact, count these signs and seasons and days and years. Isn't that something? Four gospels, four things that lights are for. And my daddy, I've told this story a billion times. My daddy planted by the signs. Got a farmer's almanac every year and looked at that thing and he figured out when he's going to plant his tomatoes and his peas and his cucumbers and all those things I didn't like to pick. And I didn't like eating them. And I had to pick them anyway. That made me mad. And then we had to shell the stupid things. Boy, we had it bad, didn't we, Melissa Kay? Had it rough. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and it was so and God made two great lights the greater light to rule the day and look at this look at the language now the lesser light to do what rule rule we wrestle against the rulers of the darkness of this world so this is a simple question but ask yourself what is it that comes out in the daytime? The sun. Now, let me ask you a question. Right now, the sun's out. But are there stars up there too? Can you see them? Why? Because it's a... Hey, Everett figured it. It's daytime, dummy. Right, Everett? It's daytime. Why? The sun always is going to be... The, the brightest star in the heavens. Amen. And who's the sun? He's the sun of righteousness. His face shines like a sun. And when in the Mount of Transfiguration, he is the sun. Amen. And by the way, so, turn, turn your Bible, Psalm 19. Can I give you a little astronomy lesson? I hope you like this. I mean, it's for free. I don't make you pay nothing for it. Psalm 19. Look at this. The heavens declare the glory of God. Somebody say amen to that. And the firmament showeth his handiwork. How is it that you can go out at night and look up at the stars and say, boy, that all happened by accident. Look at that. And if you know anything about, if you know anything about two stars in the sky, I mean, how many of you can find the Big Dipper? Now, I'm going to ask you a question. How many of you can find the Big Dipper in the wintertime? Oh, I'm glad you didn't raise your hand. It ain't there. Orion is. I know two constellations. I know the Big Dipper and I know Orion. Orion's always in the wintertime. Big Dipper's always in the summertime. Always. Now, who made that in such a precise order? God did. And it's a repetitive order. It's been happening every year year 
The firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter a speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. And you look out at those stars and say, man, somebody put them there. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth. That means what they preach is gone everywhere in the earth. Everybody in the earth has seen the same stars you have. And their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for what? Guess who the son is? Verse 5, he's the bridegroom. Woo! Amen! The son is the bridegroom. Coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit unto the end of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. I'm telling you what, God is over everything. That's why he's called the most high God. Is that when the sun comes out, there ain't no more moon and there ain't no more stars. Amen. But at night, when it gets dark, what's out there? Now look at your Bible. Verse 16 again, God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day. That's the sun. He's the ruler of the day. And those who walk in the light, he's the ruler over those who walk in the light. And the lesser light to rule the night. Satan will never be as powerful as Jesus Christ. And... He made the stars also, which are there in the night. So the moon and the stars represent the rulers of the darkness of this world. And verse 18, there it is. To rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good in the evening and the morning were what day? Fourth day, Jerry. Isn't that something? God does everything in perfect order. Now, think about animals. Psalm 104.20, Thou makest darkness, and it is night, wherein all the beasts of the forest do creep forth. Notice the animals that I have up on the screen. In fact, let me, let me take a peek at my notes. Yeah, I'm going there. Snakes, they usually hide during the daytime, don't they? Hide under rocks, hide under logs, hide under tall grass. Lions, lions can hunt at night. They can't be seen very good. But they're out there and you never know it until you've got your head in one of them's mouth. Notice I have owls. Out there. We're going to read something from our Bible. Notice all these creatures that are terrors in the night. By the way, they're all... What do snakes and lions and owls eat? Do they eat fruit trees and wheat and grass and seeds? and What do they eat? Flesh. They hunger and crave flesh. In fact, when God gave Moses the law and he gave them the list of food that they could eat and the food that they couldn't eat, when he d divided up the birds that they could eat, practically all of those birds were seed eaters. The birds that were unclean were all flesh eaters. Who of you on Thanksgiving has a turkey vulture on your table to eat? Have you ever seen what a turkey vulture eats? Them old red-headed nasty vultures? Road killing maggots. Amen. I'd rather have the turkey than the vulture. Amen. It just makes sense, doesn't it? Turkeys will eat clean. Turkey vultures won't. So God said they're unclean. They're also uh, terrors of the night. Turn to Psalm 13. Or Isaiah 13, excuse me. I don't know where I'm going. <laughs> Am I the only one having a problem with their sinuses today? All right. 
Isaiah 13. Isaiah 13, if you'll notice at the beginning of Isaiah 13, it's a, it's a prophecy against who? Babylon. Babylon is the opposite of God's kingdom. There's, this, there's the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, and then there's the kingdom of Babylon or the kingdom of hell. This is the burden of Babylon. And God said in uh, Isaiah chapter 13, For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And so when God, watch this now, watch this. When God darkens the earth, and not even, not the sun, not even the moon, and not even the stars will shine when it's absolute, complete darkness. Notice what happens. Verse 21. The wild beasts of the desert shall lie there. Snakes and lions and doleful creatures shall lie there and their houses shall be full of doleful creatures. You know what that is? A doleful creature is like any kind of bird or any kind of animal that makes a sound like someone in mourning. What do they call a dove sound? A cry. Doves are the ones who are sounding like, whoo, whoo, like someone in mourning. Owls are the same way. Owls are, are representative of devils. These are all, all of these animals, all of these birds that you're seeing here. Owls shall dwell there. They represent devils, um, evil angels, gods with a little g and so on. And satyrs shall dance there. Satyrs is defined in another place in the Bible as devils. And the wild beasts of the island shall cry in their desolate houses and dragons in their pleasant palaces. And her time is near to come and her days shall not be prolonged. Now I want you to think about what your Bible is saying here. And I've preached this in various ways before, but it's going to just hopefully fit right in here. When there is darkness in your life, let's say, let's say that it's emotional darkness. Let's say that you are having problems and, and there are problems with emotions. Maybe something has happened and you are, find yourself in a very dark place. Believe me when I tell you that happens to preachers too. When you are, when you find yourself in a very, very dark place, the Bible is telling you that when those lights go off and you're in darkness, you're going to be surrounded with all kinds of evil angels, devils, creatures, rulers of the darkness of this world. Beings and beasts that don't have a problem being out at night. And notice that it mentions dragons. Who's the dragon in the Bible? Satan. And I do believe that there are other devils that if we were, if God were to open our eyes the way He did uh, in the days of Elisha with his servant, God, the Lord opened his eyes and he saw chariots of fire and horses of fire. I believe if God could open our eyes and we could see into the spiritual world, we would see there are times we are surrounded by dragons, serpents, monsters. These are all devils. And all of these Love to show up in darkness. Let's say that, let's say that your life, you kind of let things go with your walk with God. And you got back into some sins that you wanted out of. And at first, it seemed like it was, things were going okay. But what you didn't recognize, you know, something that God did on this earth is that God made the sun and the moon and the stars to move so slowly we cannot detect their movement. Nobody, nobody 
has the ability to watch the moon go across the sky. Nobody, nobody can do that. We can mark its spot one minute, come back ten minutes and look at it that it's in another spot ten minutes later, but we can't see it moving. What I'm trying to tell you is most of the time you will end up in darkness and never know how you got there. But let me tell you, as somebody who knows both from the sinner's side and the preacher's side, that's, that's what sin brings to your life. Darkness. Darkness is because of your sin, slowly but surely, you don't, you want less and less and less of the Word of God shining in your life. It's like it's noon and then before you know it, it's sunset. And that sun is just about to disappear. And you're fixing to be in darkness. I knew a guy that uh, he used to work a night shift at a chemical plant. And he was a big deer hunter. And he worked that night shift. And he got off work early and drove out to his deer stand. And he just basically sat up in a tree. And he got up in that tree and got comfortable, got his legs stretched out across that limb there, and that sun come up and warmed him up, and he fell asleep. And he woke up, it was dark. He fell asleep and slept in that tree all day long, didn't know it. And he said, when I woke up, he said, it scared me. I didn't know how long I'd been, been there. I'd checking my beard, you know. And he climbed out, out of that tree and he finally found out he had just slept all day long up in that tree. He had no idea that the night was coming. He slept all day through it. And this is how sin works in a person's life. It will creep up on you like these beasts. They're out there. They're there now. And all they're doing is waiting for it to get dark in your life. And I guarantee you, they're there not for you to pet them. They're not a petting zoo. They're there to devour you. They're there to devour you. They're there to devour your marriage. Most marriages that end up split up, it's usually due to sin. Am I right? Sin, adultery, fornication, drunkenness, drugs, all of those things. That's usually why most marriages bust up. The darkness crept in and the devils came out, the dragons and the lions and the satyrs and the owls. And all they did was devour. Turn to um, Isaiah 34. I don't know if that's in my notes too. No, it's not. Turn to Isaiah 34. I might as well keep on that track there. You're going to see the same thing here. In Isaiah 34. Yeah, there it is. If you look at verse 2. The indignation of the Lord is upon all nations and His fury is upon all their armies. Armies, He hath utterly destroyed them. He hath delivered them to the slaughter. Why is that? Look at verse 8. It is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. Do you believe that God has a day of, of revenge? Who, who would say amen to that? You believe God has a day of recompense. You know what that is? Payback. Payback. In verse 9, the streams thereof shall be turned into pitch. The streams. Think of the, think of the water of God's Word running crystal clear into your life, giving you refreshing day after day after day. And because of your sin, what did God do to the, to the rivers and to the streams in your life? He turned, they, instead of putting out water, they put out tar and oil. 
and the dust thereof into brimstone, and the land thereof shall become burning pitch. Did you know that's probably what hell looks like? And it shall not be quenched night nor day. The smoke thereof shall go up forever. From generation to generation it shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. Now look at verse 11. In fact, this is, yeah, God, God, you're, boy, you're good. And you'll say amen because when you find out I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, oh, yeah, about eight, eight more slides to go through. You'll say, Amen! He don't hang, he ain't going to do that this morning. Look at verse 11. The cormorant and the bittern shall possess it. Those are both birds that eat flesh. And there's the owls again. The owl also. And the re... You know what I found out, John? Going to that MUFON conference. There's a guy that has written about four books on owl manifestations along with UFOs. He's going to be a speaker this year. I'm going to go hear him. Um, where was I? Thank you very much. You could have told me verse 17 and we'd have all left here. It's Ron's fault. The owl also and the raven. What do ravens eat? Anything dead shall dwell in it and he shall stretch upon it the line of what? Confusion. That means you read your Bible, but you say, I don't get anything out of this. And the stones of emptiness. And they shall call the nobles thereof to the kingdom, but none shall be there. And all her princes shall be nothing. And thorns shall come up in her palaces. What did God curse the ground with after Adam's sin? Thorns, nettles, and brambles in the fortresses thereof. And it shall be a habitation. There, look at here. Dragons are there again. And owls, a court for owls. Back in Isaiah uh, 13, they were in the pleasant palaces and they were in the home. In the place where there was a family and there was love and there was light in that family. Now it's darkness. And in that house, it, that house that once was possessed by a loving family and a family that prayed and a family that believed the Bible because of sin. The dragons moved in because it got dark. And the sun went out and the moon and the stars wouldn't even shine. Verse 14, the wild beast of the desert shall also meet with the wild beast of the island. There's the satyrs again, shall cry to his fellow. The screech owl also shall rest there and find for herself a place of rest. Listen, <laughs> you can usually tell when revival is happening in your life and when it's not. If you've got evil spirits all over you and they just won't leave, more than likely, they built a nest. How many of you ever had a problem with bees or wasps? I mean, bad problem with bees or wasps around your house. And I'm not, I'm not just talking about one or two. I'm talking about 50. Every time you walk out the door, it just seems like you get attacked. You've got to find somebody that can get those things out of there. Because you know what happened? One sin turned into two, and it turned into four, and it multiplied, and all of a sudden, it got darker and darker. And where do bees build their hives at? Out in the sunshine? In the dark. And all of a sudden now, the owls have built a nest there, and they're not going anywhere. And all of a sudden, the, the bees are there. And all of a sudden, the snakes, they got a nest in there too. And it, before long, your house is just full of doleful creatures. Destroying creatures. That's what's happened to our country, by the way. Can you see it? 
We got nests up in Washington, D.C. That apparently ain't going anywhere for a while. So it said in verse 14, The wild beasts of the desert shall also meet with the wild beasts of the island, and the satyr shall cry to his fellow, The screech shall also shall rest there, and find herself a place of rest. In verse 15, And there shall the great owl make her nest, and lay, and hatch, and gather. Now there's more of them there. What did Jesus warn us about? When an unclean spirit left the house, and he wanders in the wilderness, and he comes back, he finds the house swept and garnished. But when he comes back, does he come back alone? No, he brings seven other worse than he is. And let me tell you something about backsliding. You might have done it at one time in your life. I wouldn't recommend you do it again. Because that time, you may never make it back home. They'll lay and hatch and gather under her shadow and there shall the vultures also be gathered, every one with her mate. And they're just making more and more and more. And now your house is a house of wickedness. Now you pass it on to your children. Now your children have passed it on to their children. And you've got grandkids that are little devils. Amen. By the way, your grandkids are not angels. I'm here to tell you this right now. If my grandkids ain't angels, then your grandkids ain't angels. Now, you want to see the antidote to all this? How about the very next verse? What does it say? And do what? Don't just seek it. Read it. And no one of these shall fail. None shall want her mate. You know what that means? That means you're going to read the story of Moses one day. And you're going to be full of knowledge. And then you're going to start reading something in Hebrews. And all of a sudden you'll go, oh, I know what that means. I know what the lamb is. The lamb that was slain is Christ. The blood that was put on the doorpost, that was Christ's blood that protects us from the destroyer, amen. You start getting the Bible out and reading the Bible, and all of a sudden, there's no room in your house for lions and snakes and dragons and owls and little creepy critters running all over the place. There's only room for the light, and every one of those creatures hate the light. Somebody say amen. And I'll tell you something else they hate more than anything. I've used this illustration so many times. If you were to be walking through the woods somewhere and find some old barn or some old house somewhere, you go in there and you find you're going to find all kinds of critters. That's because no man lives there. When you get the man back in the house, the creatures are gone. You know who the man is, don't you? That's Jesus Christ. None shall want her mate, for my mouth it hath commanded, and his spirit it hath gathered them. I'm going to ask you this morning, just bow your head, close your eyes. And only you, only you, know the answer to this. I've given you just a little bit of lesson now on what a dark life is like. And I guarantee you, I didn't preach nothing to you or teach nothing to you that, number one, you haven't already been through, and number two, that I haven't already been through. I am no different than anybody else in this church. In fact, the Bible says it, let he who is chief among you be servant of all. I'm the pastor, but that just means that I'm the servant to everybody in this church. And I guarantee you, if you've been through it, I probably have too. Maybe in a different way, but I've been there. I've been down in the darkness. Very dark 
And the vultures were there. And the dragons were there. And the serpents were there with their poison. To poison my mind so that I never, ever understand a word of the Bible again. And God, one day, shined the light in my heart. And I've never been the same since then. Thank God. So this morning, just with your head bowed and between you and God, you need to get out a light meter and find out just how much light is in your life. You may not have noticed it, but the sun has been going down on you for a while. You just never, never paid attention. And before it gets dark, before it gets past the point of no return, maybe you need to cry out to God this morning. So while you're sitting where you're sitting, I'm going to pray for you. And I'm going to pray for your soul. And I'm going to pray for those that are online and those that are listening on the radio in Kenya. I'm going to pray for some pastors out there that maybe are in darkness. They've been following the false prophets that are in Kenya. They've been listening to words that are not the word of God. And they've been given a false light, but it's just darkness is all it is. Father, I come before you today. I thank you, Lord, for this message. I thank you, Lord, for taking it where you took it. It just seemed right, Lord, that those who are in darkness need to find out how to get out of the darkness. And the only way to get out of that darkness is to seek out the book of the Lord and read. For therein is light. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The entrance of thy words bringeth light. God said four words. Let there be light. And the light was the light of life that lighteth all men. Father, would you reach down in some sinner's heart this morning, here, there, or anywhere, and touch someone and speak light into their life because they have been in a dark, place. God, would you do that for someone who needs it, someone who calls for it, someone who cries out for it, because they don't like the lizards and the snakes, and they don't like the things that go bump in the night. They don't like waking up late at night and seeing some evil spirit standing at the end of their bed. Father, Lord, would you turn the light on so that those things go away. Teach us, God, how to wrestle against the rulers of the darkness of this world and have light and victory in our life. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Would you stand to your feet, please?